Hello again. Well, viewers, we have nearly come to the end of our 200-year journey through the history of British women in the air. We've gone from the very first hot air balloons and the invention of the aeroplane right up to the modern day. Now we'll look at how jets transformed the world and how rockets took humanity into space. As the Second World War drew to a close, countries raced to become the first to deploy jet aircraft. Hello. Cyril Servant, what are you doing here? Interjecting. What have you done with Captain Ridgeable? Budget constraints. He's had to be... deflated. Oh dear. So what are you going to talk about? Bureaucratic interference. My specialty. Guess we'll have to see where this goes. The Gloucester Meteor, thanks to Frank Whittle's pioneering turbojet engine, became Britain's first fighter jet. While it came too late to play a major role in combat, it marked a new era of flight. If you'd like to know more, check out our video here. Veronica Volquez was an air transport auxiliary pilot during the war. It was an unusual career choice for a beauty pageant queen, but she proved herself an excellent pilot. The main job of the ATA was to transport aircraft between factories and bases, and they were nicknamed Anything to Anywhere because they really could fly any aircraft to any destination. Just two weeks after the Japanese surrender, Veronica became the first British woman to fly a jet. A meteor needed ferrying between airfields. It wouldn't be a very long flight, but it was significant. With no formal training on the aircraft, just a look at the pilot's notes, she was able to fly and deliver the jet successfully. To Veronica, it was all in a day's work, but she had ushered in a new era of aviation. Jets were taking humanity faster than ever before. In the 1920s, the major race was to cross the Atlantic Ocean. Just 20 years later, the race was to fly faster than the speed of sound. The first person recorded as doing so was the American Chuck Yeager in 1947. It's widely believed that, the following year, John Derry became the first British pilot to do it. But jets were dangerous. In 1952, John Derry died when his DH-110 broke up mid-air at the Farnborough Air Show, killing 29 spectators. It's always been dangerous to be at the cutting edge of flying technology. But now that it had been demonstrated that it was possible to fly faster than the speed of sound, women pilots too set their sights on the record. Ahem. As admirable as supersonic flight is, the British government was very reluctant to give anyone, male or female, the chance to do it. The leading British supersonic research programme, the Miles M-52, was cancelled in 1946 and the technology given to the Americans. Safety was given as the excuse to not spend the money. A few years later, it was decided that we should keep up and if everyone else was going to fly supersonic, then we really ought to as well. Alright, Cyril. Once the RAF had supersonic jets, Jackie Mogridge set her sights on becoming the first woman to break the sound barrier. She had flown 83 different types of aircraft with the ATA during the war and had 3,000 hours of flying experience. She could demonstrate the power of British jets and become the first woman to go supersonic. Sadly, the Air Ministry would not allow her to fly, even with Prince Philip doing his part to help. The fact is, high-speed flight was still incredibly dangerous. Britain had suffered a number of fatal accidents during high-speed test flights. A tragic example of this is a DH Swallow. 
three experimental prototypes were built and all three were destroyed in fatal high-speed test flights. One of the pilots killed, Geoffrey de Havilland Jr., was a son of legendary aircraft designer Geoffrey de Havilland. He lost two of his sons in fatal test flying accidents in aircraft which he designed. The authorities simply did not want such a high-profile disaster as a woman being killed during a high-speed stunt. The Americans took the upper hand, and the first woman to break the sound barrier was Jackie Cochran in 1953. It would be 12 years before a British woman was finally given the opportunity to do the same. Diana Banato Walker was another brilliant ATA pilot. By the end of the war, she had flown 80 types of aircraft and delivered 260 Spitfires. But it was not until 1963 that she was given the opportunity for supersonic flight. What had changed since the days of Jackie Mogridge was a development of the English Electric Lightning, or Frightening, as it was called, because it was very fast. Developed in the 1950s, it was at the cutting edge of technology. In 1958, it became the first British aircraft to reach Mach 2, twice the speed of sound. It would be perfect for a supersonic attempt, but the Minister of Defence still had to authorise it. If Diana Walker could safely demonstrate the speed of the aircraft, then perhaps it would be good publicity for selling it to other countries. The argument worked. In August 1963, after extensive preparations, Diana took the controls of the Lightning and set off. She reached an incredible Mach 1.65, 1,262 miles per hour. She hadn't just broken the sound barrier, she was the fastest woman in the world. And to prove Cyril's point, in 1965, the Royal Saudi Air Force ordered a fleet of Lightnings. The golden age of aerial exploration was the 1920s and 30s. But with most of the world now accessible by commercial passenger flights, what records were left to break? Was there anything left to explore? For ambitious female pilots, the last remaining challenge was to fly around the world. The first woman to fly around the world was the American Jerry Mock in 1964. Just two years later, Sheila Scott became the first British pilot to do the same. As if that wasn't enough, she would fly around the world twice more, going a different route each time. One type of aircraft we've not mentioned so far is helicopters, and in 1997, Jennifer Murray became the first woman to fly around the world in a helicopter. Polly Vasher's round-the-world flight in 2001 is notable, not just because it was the first time someone flew via both polar regions, but also because it was in aid of a disability charity. She continued to support this charity with a flight in 2003, which made her the first woman to fly over both poles. There were also professional records to break. It took many years for women to be allowed into the world of commercial flying. In 1960, Yvonne Pope Sintes became the first British female air traffic controller at Gatwick Airport. Not content to just direct planes, in 1972 she also became the first British female commercial airline captain. In 1976, Concorde made its debut as the first supersonic commercial airliner. As luxury premium travel for very busy people, it could fly from London to New York in just three and a half hours, compared to a modern average time of eight hours. Barbara Harmer, in 1993, became the first woman to qualify as a Concorde pilot. Space, the final frontier. Though the space race between the US and the Soviet Union is very well known, Britain largely didn't get involved. Britain launched satellites, but wasn't really interested in a proper space programme. It was obvious that the space race was going to be between the US and the USSR. Any British investment would be worth peanuts in comparison. 
As you will remember from the story of the airships R100 and R101, sometimes the privately funded option is better. In 1989, Project Juno was launched, a private enterprise to finally put a British person into space. Project Juno was launched with an appeal for astronaut wanted, no experience necessary. 13,000 people applied, and after a rigorous selection process, Helen Sharman, a chemist at the Mars Chocolate Company, was selected. After two years of intense training, Helen Sharman became the first Briton in space when she joined the Soviet Mir space station for nine days in May 1991. It's taken a long time for Britain to get involved in space. Tim Peake became only the second British astronaut and the first state-funded one when he was selected by the European Space Agency in 2009. And that brings us to the end of this incredible journey. We've travelled through 200 years of aviation history, exploring the lives of fascinating and inspiring British women who defied the expectations of their day in pursuit of something higher. Many of them have been forgotten about until now, and I myself hadn't heard of a lot of them until I read Magnificent Women and Flying Machines by Sally Smith, which is the main source for this video series. And who knows, maybe there's someone watching this who will become the next great British flyer. In the meantime, thank you Captain Ridgeable, thank you Cyril Servant, and most of all, thank you viewers. names.